Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here for the session, Excelling Science Accelerators, the do's and don'ts of acceleration and incubation in the area of sciencepreneurship. Uh, my name is Bennett, Bennett Bart. I'm Managing Director of Respond. It's an accelerator program in itself, uh, so I know a thing or two about accelerators as well. Um, and this session is brought to you by Berlin Partners, so thanks so much uh, at this point to Berlin Partners for facilitating this discussion today. Um, we have roughly 50 minutes to discuss. I'm planning to have some Q&A in the end for you guys to engage also with the panelists here. Um, and I really want to make sure that this is a lively discussion, perhaps even a joint sort of learning opportunity about the things that we can do better going forward in the space of acceleration and incubation in sciencepreneurship. So on the panel, I have uh, the pleasure to have with me Jeanette with uh, Merantix, the CFO at Merantix, and you'll talk about uh, your work in a moment there. We also have Marin. Thanks for being here, Marin. Marin is founder and program director at Vision Health Pioneers Accelerator, a health accelerator based in Berlin. We have Christian Rommel. Thanks for being here as well. Head of R&D at Biopharmaceuticals. And finally, Torsten Lambertus, who is managing director at Deep, a program, I think, is it, is it the right term, program? Oh, Deep is the institute, the program is the Creative Destruction Lab. But okay, so the, both is creative, oh, good. <laughs> okay, the creative Destruction Lab at ESMT Berlin. Now, before we dive into um, the do's and don'ts of acceleration, I would like to start the discussion with you, actually, Jeanette, and ask you, from your experience with the Venture Studio Merantix, what are the ingredients that make a good deep tech startup? First, thanks very much for having me, and hello, everyone. Um, as introduced uh, by Bennett, my name is Janet. I'm CFO at Merantix, and uh, what we do at Merantix is that we build AI-first companies. Uh, we do that industry agnostic, um, but all with a focus on AI, artificial intelligence. And uh, we've built eight ventures so far. Um, two of them are in healthcare. We have one in biotech. Then there is analytics companies. Uh, we also have one in um, climate, ESG. So um, that varies across. And we've just also launched a company in manufacturing. And um, answering to your questions, I think um, the most important thing is an interdisciplinary team. So I think it doesn't only require people from research or from tech, but also business product people, regulatory people, because in the end, if we build uh, deep tech ventures, um, they are very, very complex and difficult to build. So we have a hard um, nut um, to crack. And um, I think the second, which then also is mirrored again in, in the team, is that, yes, we need amazing tech, and, and for that we need great science. But in the end, uh, we have to find a market um, that is gr big, but that's also ready. And then I think that translates to um, who is my client and who can I actually sell first? Because in the end, yes, I have to uh, build traction, I have to generate revenue, but foremost, I have to find partners who I can build the product with because I cannot hide somewhere, build something amazing, and then now go out there that um, the market is actually not ready for it um, from, from a mindset point of view, from a technical point of view, or, or whatsoever. Um, and then that also, maybe that brings me to the last point, it, it's a product um, and, and a go-to-market business model strategy um, that, that drowns that pretty well. And I think for that, um, not only um, competencies in, in science are required, um, but in, 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 in other uh, disciplinaries uh, as well. And how do you go about these three aspects that you mentioned, the interdisciplinary team, the market scoping and sizing, and the business model strategy? How do you implement this in the work that you do? Um, I think one of um, our key aspects uh, when we um, start a venture is uh, building an amazing team because um, in the end we cannot know everything especially if we do it industry agnostic so it's for us about uh, assembling um, those great talents and that they actually then um, take care of this or do it together with us um, yeah okay great I want to turn to you, Marin, um, because you're obviously very experienced in the space of accelerators. And now hearing what Jeanette was saying about the team, the market, and the, the business model strategy, especially in bridging from science to 
to sort of the, the business aspects, what is the role that accelerators and incubators like yours take in, in facilitating that? Um, I think in, in our case, um, I'm uh, the founder of Vision Health Pioneers Incubator. We started in 2019, so quite late. Um, I think at the moment we have like close to 40 incubation acceleration programs in Berlin, so a lot. It, it is a kind of industry in its own. It's a business, it's an ecosystem. And I think we are all facilitators. Um, I think what we learned is um, that also coming back to Janet, there's also a shift in um, who wants to become an entrepreneur these days. Um, and when I was downstairs, I was listening to people first, encouragement, we talked about diversity. Um, in our case, um, we focus on health tech um, and we also see a lot of therapists, doctors coming in. So people that are kind of outside of the science environment because they have been in business for a couple of years, um, having praxis, um, also being a therapist, they're not attached to technology. Um, they know that there needs to be change, they see the need, but they're not necessarily um, trained at universities from an academic background uh, to take um, the last leap, as we say, and you know, start a business. So um, in, in our case, um, we see there is a huge untapped potential of um, potential entrepreneurs and that you know want to start something maybe they're also you know part of this very vibrant ecosystem in berlin if you go into a coffee shop and you wonder where people are sitting there with their laptops you also wonder could i be that person could i actually also start something you listen to your kids um, you listen to your family members and they're like oh i test something here or at university i do a design thinking class it was super inspiring um and um in many ways and the programs that we run, and we actually have two incubation programs, one's in health tech and one in applied data. Um, we, we provide um, a safe launch pad for the non-classic entrepreneurs, um, which also means we bring a new breed of entrepreneurs, I think, into the city of Berlin. Um, maybe not with the, the easiest business models, um, maybe we have people that are not as savvy, they don't understand tech, business and maybe also market uh, dynamics, but this is what we teach them. And how, how exactly is your program structured? Like what, if, if I were to be one of those people in a coffee shop with, with a computer, <laughs> like what could I expect from your program? Um, um, if you see the, the, early, the early accelerator and incubation programs, they usually had a very short time frame. Um, they were usually like three, maximum like six months. Um, most of the time they build on the fact that there's somebody coming either from university or from the outside that already had a prototype or a rough business model. Um, the early programs focused a lot on entrepreneurs that came out of university. So you have PhDs that worked for many, many years on a project and then they tried to spin it out um, and make a product out of that. Um, in, in our case, um, we have a nine to 12 months program. It sounds awfully long, but it's actually very short. Um, if you see um, medtech and deep tech products, they take much longer than a marketplace, like you know, six to 10 years ago, we had a very strong focus on e-commerce and creative industries in Berlin. Of course, the fashion and e-commerce industry um, was also fueled by the Salandos of this world. Nowadays, we talk about 3D printed organs. Um, we talk about computer added drug design which again, it's not done in six months. Um, in our programs in the first three months, especially because we have people from outside the startup community, we also talk a lot about project management, being self-independent, learning how to make decisions, because if you are employed, you're not necessarily used to decision-making all the time. You're not used to think like an entrepreneur, to take ownership, to feel encouraged. And I think the first three months, this is something that we focus on a lot. Um, a lot of revelations, by the way. You learn a lot about personalities if you do that. The second part is um, learning how to build a good product, learning how to talk to the audience, the customers. And the last part is commercialization. So we don't look immediately into market and how to generate business. We also give the founders a little space to find their way and to understand how a future career as an entrepreneur could look like. And to be honest, we also lose founders in this time frame because after 12 months, if you realize there's a lot of responsibility also if you want to enter the healthcare market with a good quality product. And some of the founders realized, I'm not a founder. It's completely fine because we also see 
um, highly qualified people with entrepreneurial mindsets, they get hired. They, you know, fuel the industry, the community in Berlin in a different way. And we're also good with that. So you don't have to find a company at the end. You could also take the journey, become more entrepreneurial, and then you can work in public authorities and other startups at Bayer or any of the companies that do health tech in Berlin. Yeah, I think th th that's a very relevant point that you're raising, that not all entrepreneurs need to go on to raise a like uh, to build a startup, right? There is a place for entrepreneurs within large corporates, for example, in sort of changing the, the mindset, the approach, the agility of sort of more established companies as well. Um, but you said something interesting. You said somewhat you were late to the party in 2018 when you started the accelerator program, in a way. Um, now, Torsten, you literally just launched, so <laughs> you're even later to the party, sorry to say like that. But what is your thesis in entering the, the market at this point? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, CDL, the Creative Destruction App, is not a new program. It started in 2012, originated from Toronto in Canada, and has been launching a lot of sites in North America and now also in Europe, always in uh, close collaboration with a uh, business school. So in Europe, this is HSC in Paris. This is uh, Oxford Said Business School uh, in Oxford, for example. Uh, and I think that's a nice combination of business and a deep tech acceleration. Yes, we are new to Germany. That's the first stream over here. Um, we have seen a huge wave of accelerators, incubators, and all that program in the past. I fully agree. We need a, a, a we need a, a consolidation of those programs because there's too many, and uh, most of them never reach a critical mass of participants and thereby don't get the real impact. Um, at the end of the day, I, I think when it comes to deep tech related accelerators, there's a huge gap. Because as you said rightly, most of them are still 12 weeks off the shelf programs, uh, try a really fast pace, and uh, all the network and the people involved are digital pioneers, are digital entrepreneurs. Um, and we see more and more great accelerators coming with the understanding and an appreciation for science and the understanding that it takes longer, that there is a technical risk that we also need to tackle. It's not only the market risk. Sometimes there's even only a technical risk, if you think of quantum, for example. Um, and so this, I think, is an important part. And uh, the CDL, I've been working for Fraunhofer and Max Planck for, for, for many years. And I always observe, observe this program because it's part of this rare species of deep tech accelerators for a long, long time, and I think this is what we can now bring to the table here in Berlin, which so far uh, hasn't lived up to its potential uh, of deep tech here, but I think we can uh, contribute to that. So can, can I add yeah, something? Please. I ahead. think what's, what's super, super interesting as well is, what is the KPI for an ex, um, ex successful program? Um, I mean, in the past, it's also the question, how do you evaluate success as a company? Um, it could be a good product that nobody knows about. Um, at the moment, the success of a young startup is based on how much money you raise. And again, it's much easier if you have a market forward product that you know is ready for the market in six months because you you know faster you reach more money, you can also hire more people, which also means do we have to you know base success of an accelerator of startups that come out that have a product but you know have like five million in funding and 20 employees or do we base success um, on the fact that there's a high quality product you know that fills a niche maybe it's also you know tackling rare diseases something that is also quite expensive in the healthcare industry um, and not this broad product that everybody knows about but only a small niche i think we also have to discuss what success means for us from a facilitator point of view, but also from a startup and product point of view. And I think we, we, we are still not there to really have impact-driven KPIs in mind, which is a pity because a consolidation, I mean, you also have to start somewhere, but what is success, what's impact? Um, very hard. Well, I think ultimately we need to bring those two worlds together. Um, there, have, there has always been a world of impact startups and there has been a world of commercialization or commercially driven startups. And right now I think, and this is where we need to get to, uh, we cannot afford to build companies anymore that don't create impact. And so we need both. And uh, we think if we create those companies based on all the technologies that are out there, but in only very rare cases make it out of the labs and really get into ventures, then also the money is there. And there's investors looking for exactly those cases who can do both, who have high impact and at the same time are commercially very attractive. It might also be that we need 
different VC model for supporting those startups and growing them and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, uh, we are still looking for highly, massively scalable companies uh, who become global category leaders, who create global impact because they are also commercially successful. Uh, and this is what we are aiming at. How, how far away are we from a, a scenario that you're describing? Like, is it realistic to think that VCs nowadays, that the entire innovation ecosystem is ready to, to jump on those cases that are sort of impact first, uh, applying a different mindset, perhaps leaving the, the 220, 10-year runtime VC model as we know it? Well, at least we n we see that many are l many VCs are looking for that. Uh, just just to be clear, uh, I think it's becoming a trend to be part of the deep tech world. It's becoming a trend to be part of the impact world. When I was still working as front over, my filter question was always: When a VC approached me, do you? They said, "I'm going to do deep tech investments now. What do you have for me?" And I said, "Do you do hardware?" Mm. And in ninety percent of the cases, it was a no. And so I know from a deep tech spec spectrum, they are just looking at machine learning and AI. Uh, Possibly, but right now we're we're getting there. But I still uh, we need an understanding, and I think we have sufficient money also in Germany and Europe at early stages. But this money doesn't come with a tax heaviness. So this is where the gap is. So we need also people who understand science, uh, who are able to do due diligence on that dimension as well, and at the same time understand VC and the startup world. And we are getting there, but uh, it still takes th some time. But it's great to have events like this, where these worlds come t worlds come together. Um, uh, create this mutual appreciation and start to work with each other. Super. I want to turn to you and, and Bayer's perspective. Obviously, speaking of tech savviness, I mean, your organization holds a lot of sort of knowledge internally. Um, but at the same time, for example, you're also engaging in a lot of external innovation activities with, for example, this new program that is coming to Berlin that you may want to talk about. Um, how do corporates relate to the space? And what do you think is also for corporates now the next frontier that is going to emerge when we talk about incubation and acceleration? Um, maybe no, don't forget your mic, please. Yeah, Thanks. That helps. <laughs> I, I was so listening to you there. I forgot I have to say something too. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, let me start first saying that um, and I'm, I'm sure you all agree that we need more and better medicines for you know a lot of tough diseases, right? You touched on on, on KPIs, and it ultimately, your your performance has to be in, in a high unmet need area where you need uh, innovation progress and where patients will take the medicine and benefit in a much more meaningful way, and payers are prepared to pay for it. That's part of the, uh, this too. And the solution to many of the challenges, if you think of neurodegenerative diseases, and oncology, uh, heart failure, I think as we speak, every 40 seconds in the US, somebody dies from heart failure, by the way, um, lies in innovation. And we have to ask ourselves, how can we uh, access innovation? And not just incremental innovation uh, is uh, really uh, disruptive innovation. We have to be humble and honest. We often don't find this inside our uh, company. We have a lot of innovation, but yet the most impactful disruptive innovation across the entire industry comes from un entrepreneurs, from startup, biotechs, and also from academic and, and universities. So uh, at Bayer, uh, we, we put together a strategy or a toolbox how to uh, access, hopefully I answer your question, if not, please stop me. Uh, also, we haven't done it with my colleagues yet. Uh, no need. Um, we have a toolbox on, on this. One is incubators, right? And incubators, I think, is a f really a, a very, very good concept. Because you don't want a first-time entrepreneur or a, a very courageous, crazy idea be killed at the most fragile seeding point by, you know, hardcore venture capitalist, or you, you take all your very expensive capital and you put it in, in, in high rents, or uh, you have to build your own labs and so forth. It makes no sense. I think we have an opportunity, but also responsibility at Bayer, and here in Berlin in particular, to support that. So the concept in incubator is clear, right? So you provide an infrastructure that the capital you have is spent on the science, on, on the innovation. In addition to this, it's not only providing space, it's also providing advice, being a mentorship on the technologies and so forth. But we can talk or not about the incubator concept, but I think it's very, very good. In addition to this, you know, we uh, have uh, Leap's venture capital. So it's a venture capital um, uh, at Bayer that functions like a venture capital, but yet uh, is um, 
more focused on strategic return on really uh, uh, getting access and, and accelerating innovation rather than being driven by financial returns. It maybe sounds weird to you because Bayer is a business, of course, but we think very long term. And we have 1.3 and if not more billion dollar uh, or billion euros in, in, in venture capital leaps. And if you go through the portfolio, you recognize it's almost exclusively uh, invested in some really uh, uh, crazy disruptive uh, innovation because that, that is one way for us, one element in the toolbox, one tool in the box to access innovation. And then we um, have partnerships with hospitals, with with universities and invest in, in, in science and exchange program. And sometimes, of course, we use our capital to acquire uh, innovation. And we can also talk about this if there's time. What is important when you acquire innovation? Most important is you acquire talent. Uh, the value in those companies is this, the special secret sources in the people, the creative, courageous minds. And when you do something wrong there, when you acquire innovation uh, and, and companies, you often lose the most important part. So we have toolbox there, again, incubator, a venture capital uh, strategy of building external portfolio, uh, in investing in, in, in science by partnerships, or ultimately sometimes acquire companies to enrich our innovation space. And Thank then, you. yes, we recently, um, uh, together with Berlin, <laughs> Uh, stop soon. Um, we in, uh, came up, uh, with, I think, an exciting project to bring innovation that we have by uh, startup companies we acquired in the US and in a cell, cell based therapy space called Blue Rock or Gene Therapy Ask Bio. We want to bring the know how and technology into Berlin and we want to, together with the Charité, build a cell and gene therapy center, a translational research center which is really between academic clinic and, and the industry. And, and we want to have that in Berlin. And it's, it should happening and we have a commitment and hopefully it happens at a good pace. Super, I, I do want to come back to, to Berlin and the particularities of, of Berlin in the innovation space in general. But I, let me turn to you, Jeanette, first um, and ask you, I mean, you build companies from the ground up, literally, where you see, where you see opportunities. Um, what roles, for example, do you see corporates playing in that space and how um, how could also these roles evolve going forward in order to meet these new requirements when we talk about deep tech and uh, sciencepreneurship in general? Um, I think the roles of corporates are super important because uh, most of the times um, the corporates are going to be our customers, uh, they're going to be our users, and how can I build a company, a product, without my user, my client being involved? Um, and this is why we do partner with them um, super early on and the key challenge is about identifying those um, corporate partners, industry partners who um, are willing to also take on an additional risk and to maybe have some uh, certain factors that are actually unknown, but to see this as an opportunity to have that um, being defined together with the startup. So this co-development is something uh, we do uh, very often, especially if we start a company. Uh, we do uh, win some blind pilot customers and then um, co-develop the, 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 the product together with them. And um, yeah, and I think um, for, for Merantix, how do we actually make sure that we can work with corporates uh, in the best possible way? For us, it's always important to think in ecosystems. Um, and um, this is also why we um, not only do partnerships with them and, and we write corporates at the time we um, start a new venture, but we have also um, opened up an AI campus in the heart of Berlin. It's a space that's uh, more than 5,000 square meters large. Um, and there we have corporate teams working together with us, but also with everyone else from the ecosystem, opening our doors. Uh, and as you, Christian, said, uh, it's a mindset question as well. And and we want to uh, offer that platform, not only for, for building our companies, but um, to have that spirit there in a central um, location in Berlin where everyone can come and actually also make sure that they bring uh, innovation in their own companies and in their own teams. So when you, I'm going to come back to the, to the question about KPIs. When you work with corporates, for example, Bayer in this example, is uh, like, what, what are the KPIs that you frequently encounter or settle on when you make those uh, connections, when you partner actually? And uh, do they tie really into this mindset of creating breakthrough innovation and l disruptions on a large scale versus the incremental little steps? 
I, I think, I mean, uh, if I would say that Bayer is not innovative, then I think I could leave the stage, and I definitely want to do that because, I mean, you're doing amazing stuff, so I think you're a great example of being innovative, and I don't think that we can uh, tell someone like Bayer that they're only thinking in incremental steps. I think they're doing uh, amazing research. I think for us, it's more the sales cycles and uh, the, the, the time that is needed to sign a, a contract uh, with a corporate partner because you start engaging with them and even if you get an intro to um, the C-level, um, of course the, the CEO is not going to sign a contract with, with the startup, so it's, it's, it's always forwarded somewhere in the organization, then it's lost because um, sometimes um, those corporate partners think in silos, uh, even though there's bridges in between and there's more and more um, popping up, but that makes it um, super hard. And if I want to build a product, I want to build a product fast, and even if I start with a small MVP, I have to get somewhere and I need the feedback from the market, so if I need to spend um, six, eight months first to actually only get to the point to have a contract signed and then to get things started, that uh, can already mean that uh, basically my opportunity is lost. And that's where um, first um, certain programs of, of, of corporate partners help because they're structured in a way um, that it's, it's more easy to uh, enter collaborations with them. And for us, it's also about sometimes not directly choosing the, the, the route of a big corporate partner, but instead, for example, work with another startup, work with scale-ups that tend to be a little bit more agile and, and faster. Christian. I can see him burning under your fingernails. Yeah, no, because it's, uh, some 20 years ago, I, I, I was in, in, in a startup as well, and I, this, this time never got lost on me. So it's still, you know, the experience there. And you were a bit too kind, because when, when you meet um, big companies, um, there's often a, a clash of a mindset situation, because young entrepreneurs, they're always thinking about what if it's going to work. And uh, companies, because of their environment, is actually not good or bad. That's why we need this interdependence and working together on this. Um, often t tend not to think, they look for reasons why it's not going to work, because, you know, how can you de-risk it, and this costs a lot of money and time, and so forth. So that's why we come back to the concept today um, of the incubator, and when you have this, this creative idea, I, th I think it's very important to build relationship to hear potential partners or where the product goes at, at the end, that you have an understanding, the end in mind at the beginning. However, only take this as a guidance and, and, and not as a pro approval or permission context. So, you know, you find too often too many people saying this is not going to work. And I think it's almost the time and place where you f zoom in more on your idea. Because what if it's going to work? If everybody knows it's going to work, why would that be great uh, disruptive innovation? So I, I, from a company perspective, we tend to think it's too early, get more data, and then we jump in when we have more confidence. And this is where you bridge with in, in certain investors. But relationship and understanding at which point you trigger significant interest and you will get rewarded is very, very important. At which milestone uh, a product is mature enough from a company perspective. But if it's not there yet, it doesn't mean you're not getting there. So you have to hold on to your dreams and, and, and don't let people tell you it's not going to work, you know. Yeah. Uh, that's sometimes not the most courageous or creative people giving you the statement. I also see it as a responsibility of us as a venture studio to actually work with our founders because, of course, when they talk to investors, they always have to have this big vision and everything is like, oh, it's going like, to basically revolutionize the world. But when I talk to um, a potential corporate partner, I have to start somewhere where they can actually understand me and they see a little bit of improvement. Um, that's maybe a little bit risky, but not too much. So we get them through the door. Um, so it's usually, of course, a little bit visionary and then depending on what kind of like person you talk to, you go uh, bigger or smaller, but it's, it's, it's really about the tiny little things, the first steps um, that, uh, that allow us to meet and then go certain steps together. So essentially what you're saying is like you're translating between two different worlds and languages, right? And I know, Marin, that we discussed previously that part of the role of accelerators and incubators is exactly that, to bridge this gap and to make sure all sides sort of meet on common terms, even though they 
speak different languages, have different mindsets perhaps. How do you do this in your programs? Um, I think that's, that's some of the hardest because um, you, you get this mix of people, they all have a vision and sometimes we, we trust the team more than, than we see in the product because sometimes we do like a pitch deck and we're like, oh, could it work? Um, uh, then we have mentors and coaches coming in and some of them are like, oh, we don't think that's going to work because again, some of the mentors and coaches also come from traditional industries. Um, I think one of the topics is always keep an open mind. Um, the benefit of doubt, um, also in the communication, try to avoid bias. So sometimes we look also into uh, people that I think the average age um, of a founder in Berlin is like 36. So we do not come in and expect that the younger generation, you know, I'm more than 40, so it's okay that I say that, um, the younger generation is more tech savvy. Um, so we always try to figure out like, what is the role of this individual? And maybe how can this person also bridge the gap into um, you know, an environment um, we do not necessarily think that you have to speak the startup language, which again, you come into a meetup in Berlin and everybody talks about due diligence and MVPs. And then as a non-founder that has not been educated to be a founder, you move into something that sounds like Chinese. Uh, because you're not used to all these words. So, so, you know, they talk about slide decks. Everything is quite English as well. Um, so. I think translation also happens with educating and trying to figure out how can we you know, bring, bring that together. Um, in one of our first incubators, we also had um, cohorts that started in 2020, right after COVID hit, by the way, um, and we moved online. Um, in the fourth month, and it was also something we were not really aware of because we, we were also not sensitive enough, um, there were a couple of teams coming to us and said, we always talk in Germany about male patients. We have a very male language. So then we realized, oh, we are also not, not on purpose, but we are also leaving female founders, but also female patients, female users out just because, you know, we did not care enough. I think it is caring, being open, listening all the time, but also maybe not looking into the stereotypes. It's quite important. And um, I also used to work in agencies. Um, I used to work uh, with larger organizations. I was working for European Commission projects. Um, and I, my vision was not to build the perfect incubator. My vision was, I take everything that I've seen in all the incubators I supported, I worked for, I puzzle it together in a way that, from my point of view, brings the best of breed together, and then learning step by step. So when we had the concept of the incubator, in the first two months, the founders gave us the feedback and said, this is what we need, this is what we want. So build, measure, learn. We listened to them, we collected the data, we learned, and we built the program step by step. I think this is also um, important because we are it, it, like it's not the, there's not a perfect accelerator or the perfect incubator. And I'm also quite sure you most likely also adopt to the German market if you see Canada, the US, different markets, different needs, different kind of founder attitudes as well. Then you come to the German market and you also have to understand it is different and you basically have to work with what you have as well. Perhaps we want it to be different as well. Oh, I think we are different in many ways. Uh, if we look at the healthcare system uh, and healthcare market, first of all, that's of course different when you compare it to the US. Uh, the mindset is different, the culture is different, but yes, this is why it's not about setting up a, an incubator or an accelerator or a venture studio or a corporate venturing unit. It's about how you execute that. And so for the CDL, for the Creative Destruction Lab, we are, and that was actually astonishing for me to understand, it's a mentor's first program. Usually I would always argue, well, it's all about the startups, right? And so how can we support them best? But the reasoning is, if we get the best mentors, and by the way, I have so many rich discussions with all the other side leads around the world of what is a perfect mentor mix, and this might vary for North America and for something that is maybe a quantum stream as opposed to a healthcare-related stream, and we need to find the right mix for our health stream here in Germany, here in Berlin. This is what we have set up right now, and this also helps, of course, people who have been operators before. I don't think uh, we are not investing into a lot of workshops and another design, design thinking workshop and a business model canvas. We are investing into people who have done that before from an entrepreneurial perspective, 
from a venture capital perspective, from a scientific perspective, working at big pharma companies, and to bring those folks in and help them to figure out um, with the teams what are the most crucial challenges for you right now. And by definition, if we assemble people primarily from the European ecosystem, they understand the rules of the game in this very ecosystem. And at the same time, the beauty of uh, being connected to all the other accelerators um, in North America is that we can exchange also mentors, that we can exchange insights, because at some point, even North American biotech startups might need to come to Europe. And of course, the other way around is uh, the, the, what we see primarily, that we need to tap into the US market uh, quite soon. And having this understanding and having those bridges helps the startups at the end of the day a lot. How many other sites of the CDL do you have globally? It's um, 12 sites okay. with, I think right now it's 20 streams. So each site can have multiple streams. We started with, with health here in Berlin, but we want to bring that and leverage that also into other verticals. Right. It's an, I love the approach, the mentor first uh, approach, because I never heard it before. Also it's counterintuitive, our... right? Because we should say, well, it's about the startups. But yeah, but if you have it the is. best people yeah. in the room as mentors, then also the best startups will come. I agree. And many of the best people with the most knowledge probably sit in like organization like yours uh, at Bayer. So I think, I mean, the, the potential for collaboration is astonishing, right? And at least from my perspective and my experience, at the same time, it's super hard to like find the ways in and find ways to meaningful and very deep collaboration still between startups and corporates. And this is actually one of the pain points that I encounter in our day-to-day -day work that you know, the, the gap seems to be so significant that it's really hard to, 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 to break those walls, literally, as we're here today. Have you found a way around that? <laughs> yeah, I just want to, so, um, when you see the best and, and, and so forth uh, sit in, in, in companies like Bayer, so I have to say yes, otherwise I'm in trouble. Uh, <laughs> but yet, look, what, we, what you find is experience, you find capabilities, historic knowledge, you find, you know, infrastructure, resource, and so forth. Um, but I have to, you know, we, we don't find enough imagination and, and fantasy for disruptive innovation. And, and I don't think anyone can claim that you have that in abundances. It can only come from, from these entrepreneur, innovative, creative minds. So this is such, we talk about something that it seems to be so natural and obvious, right? It's interdependence of a larger ecosystem in, in Berlin, which I uh, discovered now the last two years only, uh, is an amazing place for that. So, you know, we always talk about this could be Cambridge or the Bay Area at the Spray. Uh, it has nothing that should prevent this place to become a very important player in the future of the life science, healthcare, and, and digital industry. So, uh, it's all here. Can you elaborate a little bit more as to why Berlin is the place you chose for your program? Well, you know, in contrast to you, you started uh, off, say, yeah, you started off saying at the beginning, um, what does it take for for a company to be startup successful? And it's it always takes it starts with people. Uh, it, it starts with visionary, purposeful, courageous, creative people. It starts with people, and I think Berlin is a very magnetic place for for young creative people. Right? It's a cool place that you still can afford to live. Right? And that's why, by the way, you're absolutely right. And I l happened to have dinner last night with a, a venture capital from the US. They're coming here because they find talent and people love living in Berlin and it is actually affordable. Um, but I agree with you, what we don't find in Berlin is uh, senior executive management for, for companies enough. And the translational and the business aspect, even, by the way, in, in considering when you have an invention that you please capture this by intellectual property. Um, so Berlin, Berlin is a cool place. Uh, uh, and that is, uh, I think, uh, important for creative young entrepreneurs. The next thing is you have tremendous, um, for us from, from, a, from a pharmaceutical, you have a fantastic hospitals and clinic. And I only need to name one, but it's not the only one, it's Charité, right? Uh, huge and legacy, amazing history, and, and a powerhouse. And then you have uh, academic institutions, an abundance of top places, Max Planck, by the way, often now run or supported by top talent from all over the world. Yeah? Uh, you have Virco, Virtual Institute here, and then they have, we created the Bayer Cluster of Health, 
um, and and you, you of course you have capital here in in the city. You have a lot of capital actually in Germany that can be employed for innovation and in, in life science and 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 in the medical business. So I can't see anything lacking in in Berlin uh, to become an or even more so an important player in innovation in life sciences. So would it, would all of you agree, or would you challenge well, this? I part? I would have to say, uh, you know, we have to set expectations here. <laughs> um, you know, 75% of all the startups that are in our incubator, especially like in 2019 when we talked about DIGA, everybody was, yes, you know, digitization is coming. So all these companies came in and they learned, oh, we need a CE certification, we have to prove evidence. Then there's something like interoperability, GDPR. They suddenly realized that it's not easy to enter the market because the quality expectations for medical products is still quite high. In this time, there was also the switch between MDD and MDR, which also means on a European level, we made it even harder. At the moment, if you are an early stage um, med tech company and you really want to enter the market and you need to show that um, you, know, you create an impact and there is evidence, you have to follow a lot of steps. Um, and because of uh, the recertification of existing products, there's a long backlog. So nothing is, is happening too fast if you do not understand that there are certain things that you have to do because these are all road blockers. These are all small walls. You can break them down and you can learn to do that, but it's not comparable to an e-commerce platform, for instance, where you have also um, you know, templates in, in, in WordPress, then you have like Stripe, you have Klarna, you have like an info, info, uh, info um, um, an ecosystem of service providers that you could puzzle together to have like a solution off the shelf rather soon. Um, and I think um, there's, there's one topic of um, the expectations you have to set to clearly understand where's the need, um, you know, how can you enter the market, how fast can it go, how can you leverage the in, in, you know, innovation that is here, the contexts that are there. Um, I don't know if, if there's somebody from Charity here, how many startups knock on Charity's door and how many startups are let in? I think we are talking about, in general, about a small percentage. The majority of collaboration happens in research formats, like research innovation actions, maybe cross-financed by the European Commission, public grants where smaller and established players work together, or they come out of the university environments. Um, all these startups that come and knock on our door, like, yeah, there's Charité, and they for sure have to open the doors. They don't. Not because they do not want to, because they also have to select. So if there are 100 startups, I don't know if Charité is actually working with five or 10 externals. Um, and again, it's not because they don't want to, or Virtual Clinicum, or Sana, or whoever. It's also because there are rules. Um, they can't just put a product that has 55% or 60% readiness next to a patient because they have a responsibility as well to provide care at a certain level. And sometimes this is something that, um, it, you know, there, there's no match. So in terms of expectations, sometimes is be a little bit more patient, do your homework, learn to also understand the healthcare ecosystem, um, and then work with it. So it's not that there are walls that are, you know, there and they block you all the time, but you have to understand that it's not always an easy ride. Totally, I, I think the scrutiny in health tech and healthcare is definitely, um, I mean, it's it has a reason to be there, right? It makes a lot of sense. I think there's other areas when you look at, for example, IP transfer in general from universities into startups, etc., where we are hitting some of those walls. But I'm, uh, I want to hand it over to you because you also had a thing to say. No, I just wanted to say um, that I think it's okay that it's not an easy ride. I think we want to change a lot of things and if it was easy then I think um, the world would not be complex enough or, or and it actually is. Um, and I think what we should do better in Europe is also being okay with um, doing mistakes, being 
okay if someone actually something actually fails and of course it should not be failing next to a patient uh, in the hospital but I think that's where we are um, sometimes lacking um, the right mindset we always want everything to be perfect and once it's perfect we can actually sell it or we can start using it and I think that's just wrong and I think that um, should count for every single user for every single partner you're working with but also for for investors uh, and that's where I see every time I go to S, I come back so inspired because um, a lot of people think that way um, in the US or also in, in other countries or regions. Yeah, I just love it. It's really true that, uh, and, and, and that is sort of a, a culture that uh, has been established over a long time and we won't change this in, in 24 hours, but it's really great that you bring that up. One is that f failure is, is, is not lack of success. Failure is a learning and, and you keep moving. So it's okay to fail, but you know what? It's also okay to succeed. Mm. And, and, and sometimes, you know, when, when you are big successful, you know, it is, we are not in an environment where this will be celebrated. So failure is not recognized as, you know, that there was a, a brave step and, and is a learning and hopefully those people keep going. But even big success is, is not a, is a celebrated. And you see this with academic um, brilliant ideas and they almost have to apologize to their colleague that they think in a translational entrepreneurial fashion and they see innovation eventually comes into business. And, and that is something, I, I mean, what you mentioned, this is at other places too, and you're right, there is maybe more administration here, for sure it's more administration here, and we, probably we can tackle that. But the mindset, the culture that failure and success is all okay, and, and that you want to see translation of academic research into business and advancing uh, uh, you know, innovation, that, that, that is sometimes I'm, I'm surprised to see how difficult we make it to each other to take an idea in, in, into a business model. And at the same time, we are telling this since 10 years, 15 years on panels like this, right? <laughs> we don't have the right failure culture, right? And, and the question is, is do, are we able, and I think that's a very European thing, that we are, we are not like the Americans with, in many ways. Uh, and the question is, how do we leverage that? And I think there's a component to especially highly regula uh, regulated markets like in energy, like in health, where understanding things before and do a little bit of planning prior to embarking on the journey sometimes actually makes sense. And that is a very European thing. At the same time, of course, we need to encourage more people to do the risk and go and build startups and stuff like that. But I think uh, talking about DIGAS, uh, we have seen the wave of e-commerce e founders saying, and now the next thing I'm going to disrupt is healthcare. So we are just go doing it differently. Uh, we don't understand the rules of the game, but hey, well, we've done it before. Well, they don't do it. Right? They are hitting the wall because um, it's, it's not like, like an e-commerce shop. You just launch it and then you see what the market says and then you iterate on that. It, it requires a little bit more planning. So I'm not saying that we need to have a better fa failure culture, but I think always coming with this American story uh, and we are, we are not doing that here and we are not prone to, to innovate, I think that's not true. We need to try to leverage that. And at the same time, it's interesting that especially for scientists, by definition, you are on a very similar path, right? You need to explore what's your opportunity. You need to start building stuff. Uh, along the way in R&D, you will always fail and you need to iterate on that. Um, the question is how do we translate that mindset and that understanding just to building a business? Because at the end of the day, it's, it's quite similar. Uh, and this is what I think where we need to, 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 to talk also to people working on deep tech startups who are so, uh, scientists by training to, to get this understanding. Um, but hey, it's great to see the ecosystem here and all the players that are working on that. And I think we are about to build a generation of entrepreneurs who, who understand that, who will become successful if we all support them, and then they will come back. Uh, and this is also how ecosystems evolve, talking about Berlin. Uh, I'm still Munich-based. I'm part of the Munich startup ecosystem for many years. There's no single ingredient, maybe, it's a bit more industry heavy, uh, of course, in, in Munich, but I don't see a critical ingredient lacking here in Berlin that we cannot get to the same success. And the Unternehmertum story is amazing, uh, but we can bring it here. And uh, just over my summer vacation, I read The Power Law, which was all about how the, the Silicon Valley ecosystem emerged and, and Boston. We are all looking to Boston when it comes to life science and biotech. It's not that there is a magic recipe. It just took a time and some entrepreneurs to say, I'm going to build the first generation of companies. And then they're not going to build 
build uh, to, to buy an island uh, and have a good life there, they are coming back with their resources, with their expertise, with their network, and they are supporting the next generation of founders, and then you have more biotech startups, and then the next wave comes, and ultimately you have such a strong ecosystem and players like Flagship Pioneering, which is just one entity building one company after the other and creating more value every year than Germany entirely in the same sector. And I think this is where we can get to, also at, at this place here. <laughs> yeah, maybe so something to, to add from, from my end um, now that we're uh, approaching the end. We talked a lot about um, being a founder, starting a company, building something. I'm personally not a founder and I uh, don't think I could be a founder at this point of, in time, but I'm still contributing to the success of our companies. I think that's completely fine. We had a retreat with all of our founders um, a couple of weeks ago, and we did these personality tests, and everyone was like super extrovert, and, uh, and I was the only introvert in the room. And I think I learned to be extroverted as well, but I just wanna like also tell you guys, it's okay um, to not want to found something, but actually to join a, join a startup and to also develop an entrepreneurial mindset and uh, actually include that or integrate that somewhere else, except for being like the CEO or the CTO or CSO of a company. I think this is a very nice point to close on, on understanding that there's room for every kind of personality and every profile or professional profile to contribute to the space and contribute to um, bringing up those next uh, breakthroughs. And speaking of mindset shift and embracing fear of failure, I'll share one failure from my side, which is I didn't plan the time properly, so we won't have Q&A now. Um, Damn. The success and celebrating successes, on the other hand, is I think it was a very good discussion. And there will be lunch afterwards, so you can connect to the speakers as well. Thanks so much for being here, especially to you guys. Thanks for the discussion, and uh, have a good us. rest of the summit.